Uh, did he tell you that you have to perform? No, no, he did not. I did not. Which can if you wanted. He did not. Then, then I'll just at, at the, in the final five minutes, I'll give my commentary on the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> It's now time for Kevin's podcast about our podcast. <laughs> it's, the it's the reaction podcast. This episode was produced and sound designed by Burgundy Sound Studio. Burgundy Sound Studio. Sound better. Hello and welcome to Word Up Podcast. I'm Evie. Hey, I'm Bill. How are you, Bill? Uh, I'm okay. Yeah, can't <laughs> complain in this 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 no time, no space atmosphere we uh, exist in here. I'm doing quite well. Yeah, we're just hanging over oblivion. <laughs> it's it, you know right. There's no gravity. It's airless. It's awesome. We're in oblivion. Yeah, just yeah. suspended in midair, looking yeah. into the the vast chasm. Yeah, it's just great. Eating from the tubes. <laughs> right, the cap capsule food. Yeah, packets of yeah goo that we eat in space. That's Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah, great. Like washing your hair with like floating water. Right, little <laughs> globules of water that are floating in the space. Yeah, right. Yeah. Wearing socks all the time indoors. I love it. I love it. socks. Yes. Fuzzy socks. Well, it's like cotton <laughs> socks for me. That's all. <laughs> so, shall we talk about our guest? Yeah, I think so. He's been waiting for hours. We should let him in. Yeah, I think so too. So, hi, Kevin Krum. I can never <laughs> pronounce your surname. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> How are you today? Um, I, I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to the podcast, so I'm, I'm pretty energized. <laughs> so can you tell uh, our listeners who don't know about you who you are? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, uh, who, I, who am I? Uh, I am a, um uh, adopted South Korean uh, boy, uh, grew <laughs> up uh, in the Netherlands, and... Um, I um I am incredibly insanely passionate about behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And um that is also how I make my living. Um self-employed behavioral change enthusiast. Uh I get hired by uh, organizations to usually run 6 to 12 month programs uh for them to help people internally uh sustain with change behaviors. Mm -hmm. And um I think I, I've always had a, a a fascination for words as a as a kid. Uh, I think the history of, of my fascination for words traces back all the way to when I was six years old. Um and, and that's my hobby. So spoken word, uh, writing poetry, performing it on stages. Um yeah um that's I guess that that's that's what I do. And um and yeah be, being adopted growing up in the Netherlands uh, identity uh, has always been uh, 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 the constant sort of factor throughout my life. The question about what does identity mean? Yeah, and how was it for you to grow up in? Because you didn't grow up in uh, Amsterdam, right? No, I, I grew up in. The, uh, so I grew up in uh, <laughs> my first part of my childhood. I grew up in a small village, like two thousand people, and then the other second half of my childhood, I grew up in the countryside uh, with farms and fields. Wow. Okay. And um, um, so so. Uh, I think growing up in the countryside was great because as a kid, um, having all that sort of, for me, that was, that was freedom. Um, and, um, and I enjoyed it. Um, I think the, what people often, what people often think mm -hmm. is that uh, my life must, must be easier in Amsterdam than it was back in the countryside. I think this is probably one of the biggest mis misconceptions that people have. Um, I, I worked on a farm. Uh, I started. I started working on a farm when I was uh, about twelve years old, so like on, on, on weekends. And uh, the most sort of accepting people uh, that I've met were farmers. Mm. Uh, and people often think, "Well, you you grew up in a small village. You grew up in the countryside, so people must be very narrow-minded. There must be very intolerant." And Amsterdam must be super tolerant and accepting. And for me, it's been kind of the opposite. Right. Uh, yeah. But I do it really. Uh, I really love living in Amsterdam. How long have you been in Amsterdam for? On and off, uh, ten and a half years. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, with you some. Stints somewhere else. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some change in the city over 10 years. It's enough time to have uh, been here for sure. 
I think the uh, uh, sure, but, but at the same time, because you live there, um, you it's it's weird because you're part of the change. So sometimes it's it's harder to to pinpoint what has changed in Amsterdam because a lot of that change then happens gradually rather than if you leave the city for five years and then come back. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is myopia. If you're looking at it every single day, you just kind of get used to the smell. Of yeah, it, but be, yeah, right. <laughs> So I, you know, I'm fascinated. I love this term. When I was when I was researching you, I saw the idea of behavioral um, behavioral change enthusiast. Is that what you called yourself? Yeah. Was that a, a term that you coined? I mean, is that something? Because I've never heard it before. <laughs> but I think it is the sort of perfect, you know, linguistic terminology, the perfect crystallization of a concept that we're all sort of right on the cusp of now. Yeah. You know, and it's like people. Uh, I mean, obviously, back where I'm from in the United States, we're fighting this battle and. It's going one way or the other. Um, but I mean, that, that's, it's a real great way to put that. The idea is like, well, you are trying to, you know, change people's behavior. And I mean, it's, it's fascinating that you, you know, you've dedicated your life to this, but it seems that you have figured out a way to apply this to the world. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's inside your professional life. It's inside yeah. your personal life, your, your, your public life also at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's really a part of a crusade almost. Yeah, yeah it's, um, so I find so labels like expert... Uh, uh, sometimes difficult uh, because um, uh, in a lot of fields uh, expertise is developing is evolving so what, if, if if your expertise stems from like 20 years ago it is very likely to be outdated today yep. Yep. <laughs> and um, and so behavioral science is also developing and um, and so I, I to, to call myself a behavioral change expert sounded wrong to me and and so I and 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 that is important because if I tell a client who what I do and who, who I am, uh, I, I want to make sure that what I say is comes with conviction and 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 I I own it hundred percent. And so, the the also the label trainer or coach was was something I could never really relate to. And then um, uh, I always said I'm 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 passionate about behavioral change. So at some I I don't remember when, but then at some 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 point. It was, oh, enthusiast, because that's what I am. I'm an enthusiast about behavioral change. And and I'm constantly trying to learn more about it, reading books, listening to podcasts, documentaries, um, because I don't want to... Also, I don't want to get stuck in this idea that I'm already there. Like, once you, you're an expert, and, I, and, I, and I've noticed that a lot with people in, in science, I already know this. Or even in my work with, with like, um, executives, they're like, yeah, I know what leadership is. They show me, and then, and then obviously they, they fail to show it. So, so they got stuck in this idea that they already are an expert, and they don't have to learn anything else anymore. That's perfect, man. Yeah, the idea that you can't evolve. I mean, clearly the world around you is grinding on, but these people get stuck in entrenched positions, yeah. and it becomes fixed in the dogma of whatever year that they yeah. got installed. Yeah. So, what's the most interesting uh, thing about human behavior that? Uh Fascinates you also? <laughs> um, oh wow! Um, th- there are so many things, but um, so um, th- th- okay. So, so because there's too many things that I find inc- fascinating about behavior, uh, human behavior, but I'll highlight a few. Yeah. Um, uh, in random order, one um, uh, uh, people have a. Um, uh, people completely misunderstand how behavioral change works. So so most people think that just good intentions and a goal is enough for Mm. for behavior to change. And that is fundamentally (laughs) wrong. Like it's not that intentions and goals don't don't matter, but Mm -hmm. it is far less important than people think it is. The other thing that, uh, people and it's it's a lot of misconceptions and myths. A lot of an, another thing that that I've noticed a lot is that people uh, think that uh, they are in full control over their own behavior. Mm. And philosophically speaking, you can argue you are in control of your behavior, but mm. it, it does dismiss the the impact and influences of external inf- influences. So yeah. our behavior in the supermarket is influenced by very smart marketeers. Um, our beha- like, and, and as soon as there are more people involved, yeah. so in my case, when I when I work with organizations, it's it's people working together. Uh, so there are multiple people involved. Your behavior and your responses will influence mine. Yeah. And it would be naive to believe that my behavior um, 
exists in a vacuum. And so uh, a lot of people completely do not take that into consideration. Right. They think like, oh, that's easy because I can do that. And then they, they don't take into consideration that, well, there's the moment you get together with other people, their behavior, their attitude, their mood, their energy will impact yours. Yeah. Um, um, and that's another misconception about behavioral science. And then uh, the third thing I'll, I'll highlight is, and that this is something that keeps coming back in my work, and that this is probably also sadly why I have a job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are four things that I've noticed, uh, regardless of culture, regardless country, field, industry, hierarchy, age, gender, uh, et cetera, that, that keeps coming back in the mm -hmm. work that I do uh, from my observations. And that is, um, as human beings, we are incredibly bad at listening when it matters. We're not bad at listening, but we're bad at listening when it matters. Two, we are significantly more judgmental than we'd like to admit. <laughs> Three, we are very bad at transforming conflicts. So most people are either good at running away from conflicts or they're good at just trying to manage the conflict to an extent that it doesn't, you know, escalate. Mm. But we're not very good because we haven't learned the skills throughout our lives consciously on, on how to transform conflicts. And then the fourth thing that keeps popping up is um, we, as human beings, we're wired for stories. So we, cre like our brain is, creates narratives in split seconds. Yeah. Uh, we see something happening and we create a narrative about it. Some, somebody does something to us that we don't like and we create a narrative about that person. Yeah. Right? Um, a, a person cuts us off in line. And we create a narrative about that person. And we do that in split seconds. And we don't realize how quickly we create those narratives and how much those narratives influence our energy, mood, behavior. And so those four things keep coming back. And oh. it, is, <laughs> it is interesting. And, and there's an explanation for that as, as well, is that in school, we get taught all these courses like maths, language, geography. Yeah. Um, we learn how to do those calculations, like the tables, like, like one times five, two times five, yeah. three times five. And, and we learn them by heart. So we consciously learn all these, what we consider uh, often hard skills. But at no point throughout our, our, uh, our educational uh, life do we learn very consciously and deliberately interpersonal skills. So if we do end up having fairly well-developed interpersonal skills, it's, it's more sheer luck often <laughs> than that it was a, a deliberate plan. Right. Or by accident. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, which is luck, yeah. I guess. <laughs> you know, um, I found that at the age I'm at now and the circles that I run, people who, let's say, look like me and have my own cultural background, I think, I, I think everything you're saying, I, again, this is, this is it's, it's a superb way of thinking about it. And it's a, um, a great way to term this. And it occurs to me that one of the threats that people think that there's this fear of rebuke, there's this fear of punishment that comes from any of this examination, that uh, mm -hmm. the minute that you begin to track behavior, the minute that you engage in any discussion, it's merely for the purpose of being squashed or being yeah. told you're wrong. Yeah. And I, you know, this is the problem I can see even just having rational discussions with people is that they can't wrap their head around it being almost like a neutral or benign yeah. conversation. Yeah. It's punitive. And I mean, I haven't seen anybody uh, other than, you know, your sort of technique that you're describing. I haven't heard anybody, you know, talk about it in a way that seems constructive or at least, yeah. you know, you mute that punishment aspect of it. And I guess that that comes back also to uh, some of the myths around uh, behavior and misunderstandings is um, uh, myself included. Um, uh, as, as, as human beings, we, we, we are uh, often biased to think that behavior equals identity. So uh, my behavior is, is my identity. Um, but behavior can be changed. Uh, like riding a bike, learning to ride a bike does not mean anything really about your identity per se. You can, you can turn it into an identity statement, but it's not necessarily identity. So your, riding a bike has no bearing on your gender identity, uh, uh, sexual orientation, uh, race, you know, ethnicity, nothing. But as soon as somebody says something about our identity, so, so for example, feedback, like at work, somebody gives feedback or in, in uh, somebody calls out something that might be gender biased or racially biased. Um, and it's, it's a, uh, somebody says something about what we do or what we say very quickly. We usually immediately jump to the conclusion. Oh, are you saying that I'm a bad person? Mm. So one, 
is addressing behavior. And then on the receiving end, we kind of usually perceive that as an identity attack. And we need to learn to separate identity from behavior. That's super interesting. It's almost like another, it's another consequence of tribalism to some degree. I mean, again, you know, I'm coming from a very tribal uh, atmosphere right now back in my, my home country. And trying to pick through this is, you know, quite literally the, the mission of our, of our day and age, our times, is to, you know, guide the human race through some sort of transformation to, you know, a better, yeah. uh, a better way of relating to itself. And so people can just be more harmonious. Yeah. So now I would like to speak about, well, what I'm very proud of is that I've witnessed your debut as a poet <laughs> <laughs> back in, I don't know, what was it, two, three years ago? Three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Time flies. Probably three years ago, December. Wow. Okay. So uh, you call yourself word magician. Is that uh... true? <laughs> so how did you, how was your journey to poetry? Uh, so, so my journey into poetry started probably eight years ago mm-hmm. uh, when I discovered spoken word poetry uh, through, through the internet. Um, YouTube is great for, for, for discovering. So and I, I probably, I was on a website, like, I don't know, Buzzfeed or, or something like that. And, and I came across a spoken word video of a North American, of a Canadian poet. Right. And, and it, it got me hooked. I was mesmerized. And apart from the poetry exposure that you get in school, um, <laughs> but that was my first real introduction to spoken word poetry. And that was probably about eight years ago. And I think six years ago, I started writing. I think that was more of a need, a personal need, rather than a, a, a drive to ultimate to to in that moment perform. But it was a personal need to to write to uh, process uh, my, uh, my my emotions, my feelings, mm. my experiences. And uh, I think because my initial introduction to the, the world of spoken word was uh, uh, seeing another poet perform spoken word on the internet. Um, I think in the back of my mind, there was always this idea like at some point it has to get on stage. Um, mm. <laughs> so initially the writing was for myself, but then eventually um, about three years after I started writing, um, uh, I started looking into spoken word communities. Um, and that's when I discovered Word Up. Yay. <laughs> did you ever have, with, did you ever balk at um, being a, a sort of on stage? You know, the idea that you are part of the show, you are creating... And you were creating the charisma that you were projecting. You know, a lot of people just want the work to lead and they don't want to have to be the person who's reciting it or creating a performance. But obviously you don't strike me as a person who has much timidity. Maybe you do inside, but I see a public persona that's very confident. Um, did you ever struggle with that or was it a natural yeah, fit? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, rem- I remember the first uh, the first time performing at Word Up. Um, <laughs> it, it was in December. It was sort of like mid-December. It was, the, uh, and a couple of friends wanted to be there as well. But it was, it's mid-December. So it was also the time where people had Christmas dinners and stuff. Yeah. And so some of my friends had texted me that they would probably be running late. So I had asked, uh, I had asked Enyo if I could perform in the second half so that my friends would be there. And he said, well, I already put you on in the first, <laughs> but here's the deal. Um, right, like before uh, you're up, I'll, I'll give you a sign and then you can tell me if you can go or if you want to wait for the second half and I'll, I'll put someone else on. So I already got a text from my friends that they wouldn't be able to make it. Uh, so, so I could have gone any, any time. But as the moment Enio gave me a sign that I was going to be next, I was so nervous <laughs> that I, I couldn't even speak. Like I was, like, um, and I, I kind of lost my voice. And, and so I just gave him a sign that I, I would uh, have to go in the second half. And so he put somebody else on. And uh, in, during the break, I went to the toilet <laughs> and just tried to, you know, uh, get my composure back. Um, uh, that was the first time performing. Um, like incredibly nervous, and and I'm still nervous sometimes uh, performing nowadays. But I think the difference is uh, um, uh, I'm better capable of managing those the nerves. And I think the first time performing, I wasn't capable of of controlling my my breathing and 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 my heartbeat and and my my, my body basically. So I, in that moment, I couldn't perform. But nowadays, I'm still, I'm not as often nervous anymore, but uh, depending on the audience, depending on what I'm going to perform, depending on the context, I, I still uh, am nervous. And I, and personally, I have this belief that if I don't experience nerves at times, then I'm too much in my comfort zone. Yeah, I understand that. 
So I was wondering if you have something uh, prepared for us today. I can I can perform something. Yeah. Okay. Adoption in four chapters. Chapter one. When I was born, I was given up for adoption, and with it, love temporarily gave up on me. Maybe that is why I love the way I do, intense without compromising. Maybe that is why I hug a little tighter every time we say goodbye. Maybe that is why I jump head over heels every time love pushes me to the edge because I know what it feels like when love leaves without explanation. Chapter two. When I was adopted, my name changed from An Kwang Soo to Kevin Groen. My name. A game of Scrabble. My name, an upgrade, an improvement. My name, a winning combination. An Kwang Soo. 22 points, but no premiums. Kevin Groen, 18 points, but triple word value. Society continues to question my identity. An Kwang Soo. Oof. Too difficult to pronounce. Kevin Groen. No, but that's not who you really are, right? Society confused. Society not listening. Society still searching for better letters to describe who I am. Society, fuck you. Chapter three. I have learned that hamster mothers can kill their own young because of scent confusion. Maybe that is why I keep being refused acceptance by my home country. Born in the womb of my motherland, raised in the resigned embrace of another, and the distinctive scent of both never quite rubbing off. As a kid, I used to believe that if I simply scrub long and hard enough, the scent would disappear. But I fear all it ever really did was leave behind an open wound that just won't heal. Chapter 4 They gave you up for adoption with a promise of finding a better home. They never knew that finding home could feel so, so lonely. Wow. Wow. I'm like <laughs> gasping a little bit. It's so heavy, um, I find. And it's something that's so engraved in your identity, I suppose. And you and your sister, I suppose. Yeah. It's the same. Because yeah. you were adopted together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much of that carries into like uh into your work and to your what you're looking for in other people, maybe also. Um it's definitely central to my work. Identity is has always been a, a that constant factor. And I think um I've only been figuring out what identity for me means um probably in, in the past 10 years. And, uh, and so, uh, writing is for me a way to explore that and to give words to it. Mm. And, and so being adopted for me, being adopted has uh, several elements. And that is, uh, one for me, th there's a question, what does it mean to be a uh, South Korean in the Netherlands? Two, what does it mean to be a South Korean man in mm. the Netherlands? And then three, for example, what does being a South Korean man mean for the relationships that I have with people mm. and the way I navigate society? Yeah, and, and that definitely is, comes back in my writing. Yeah. And uh, I also wonder, like, you talk about being adopted, but you, I don't know uh, if you talked a lot about your adopted parents. No, I, I don't write a lot about them per se, no. Yeah. Is there a reason for um, I think, I think it's not my story to tell. Right. And I think my, uh, adopted parents, um, uh, they, their experience of what it is to raise two kids of color, being white people themselves, mm. I think is, is something that, um, uh, I need to be careful if I want to write about it right. because, um, and I think this is, this comes back to a, a certain respect and, and privilege, like. I can talk about, I think I can talk about why they adopted us because we've openly talked about it. But what it is for them to adopt us and to, and to, to go through that experience, I think is their story. And, yeah. and they need to, in a way, also then give me permission to write about that story. Yeah, of course. That's beautiful. 
Well, I mean, I feel like the, your spoken word is like a rocket ride for me to a different planet, you know? And I mean, it's one I'm very grateful to take. And I'm very grateful that you're able to, again, crystallize this stuff in language that's so clear to show me something about, you know, the human experience that I know clearly nothing about. You know, as I was, you know, I grew up in a Caucasian family in a middle American suburb, you know, no identity issues whatsoever. And, um, you know, I went through a lot of my life really being unaware of that and, and without an empathy for that sort of thing. And not, not because I was mean spirited about it, just because it wasn't really access to those yeah. stories. So it means a lot to hear about this from inside. And again, there's so many intersections. That's just so amazing. Especially me now being a resident, a visitor, a guest in a foreign country. Um, you know, it's another angle of the culture. There are so many different things going on uh, in terms of how many, um, how many stories are able to tell simultaneously at the same time. I mean, I wonder if, 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 you know, when you're, this is coming, this is a cri de cour from you, it's coming out of your heart, but I mean, you must know at the same time, it's going to hit me in a very different way. And I mean, you're not trying to be instructive, but you know that it's going to, you know, it is a message for me. It it winds up being something I could use. I mean, how much does that factor into the way you create this stuff? Um, a, A lot. So I'm on a personal mission and my mission is to make people feel more alive. And I do that through my work with behavioral change. Because when people own their own behaviors and they become more aware of how behavioral change works and how that impacts their lives, they will feel more alive. But also poetry, is a, a spoken word poetry, is a way to make people feel more alive. Because when people sit in the audience and it hits them in whatever way, it can be incredibly confronting, it can be painful, it can be relatable, it makes them feel more alive. And in that moment, they don't shy away from allowing themselves to feel something that they would otherwise not feel. So you can write a piece about, you know, depression and someone in the audience feels that and they don't push it away. In that moment, they feel more alive because they're not numbing themselves. And I think uh, for me, um, actually, there's there's a... um, uh, there's a spoken word artist and also a, a host in Berlin. His name is Nanisa Tsui. And um, years ago, I had a conversation with him at the end of a, spo- a poetry slam. And, and we had a conversation about, about the winner. And and he, he said something uh, that, that stuck with me. And, and he said, uh, he believes that as an artist, when you take to the stage and you take that time from the audience, you have a responsibility mm. to use your words responsibly. And that stuck with me because I thought that that was spot on. Like, um, whether you're a comedian, whether you're a storyteller, whether you're a poet, whether you write prose, you have a, a responsibility to use your words responsibly. And I think too few artists do that consciously. And and for me, one of the ways to use my words responsibly is to make sure that it, it, it comes from a place of purpose. Uh, and that purpose is to make the audience feel more alive. You know, and, and my worlds of my professional world and my, my hobby world of like spoken word, uh, so behavioral change, spoken word, they're not separate worlds. They, they very much um, mix. So one of the things that, that we tend to do is, right, uh, we, we, we tend to classify certain emotions as bad and certain emotions as good. Like we was like happiness is good. Joy is good. Love is good. But anger is bad. Rage is bad. Depression is bad. Frustration is bad. Like we we tell children, don't be angry, but we never tell someone, don't be happy. Right? So, but but feelings and emotions are part of the human experience. So there is no good or bad. The way I look at it is um, our relationship to each emotion defines whether the impact of it will be good or bad, will be negative or positive. So you can have a healthy relationship to anger and you can have an unhealthy relationship to anger. The same way you can have a healthy relationship to, to happiness and an unhealthy relationship to happiness. And w- when we try to push our feelings and, and emotions away, that's an unhealthy relationship. And so spoken word poetry for me is a way to draw it out of people and to let them sit there. And I think we need to give the audience more credit because sometimes we feel the need to, after a very dark, deep you know, piece, we feel the need to lift the audience up. There's no need to lift the audience up after all. We need to give the audience credit that they can deal with that and mm. uh, and, and and the beauty of a spoken word evening is that it can take you on this roller coaster from total bliss to like holy shit like i'm feeling down right now or that hit me and i want to go home and cry to suddenly you know 10 minutes later like oh my god that is so warm and loving and caring and um and to then 10 minutes later again like i'm angry about the world <laughs> and um when we allow the audience to experience that it makes them feel more alive and we start normalizing that that that's part of the human experience. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of like you you feel like you need to balance because you're taught to balance. Yeah. And like if oh, don't be sad, be happy. So it's yeah okay. <laughs> but yeah, I really agree that, and it's with that, and uh, it's for me, it's really hard to to stop myself of doing that because I'm like, oh, let's talk about something jolly now. <laughs> Do you um, engage with younger audiences? I mean, you mostly do, because I could see there's being a ton of value in which you have to say the younger someone could hear it. These are the lessons that get, you know, concretized so quickly when we approach young adulthood. Um, you know, adolescence is exactly the time when you tune stuff out because you just think it's beneath yeah. you because you're a yeah. jerk when you're a kid. But it's precisely when you need to hear these things, when you're starting to build that identity. Yeah. Um, I predominantly work with uh, adults. Um, and sometimes I get an opportunity to work with uh, younger people. And when I say younger people, it typically then is in the range of, let's say, 18 to mid-20. But then um, two years ago, I had an opportunity. Uh, no, actually, um, last year, I had an opportunity to work in a, to spend a week in a school. Like uh, this was 12, 15-year-olds. And it was a school where, like, in the middle of nowhere in Germany. And they had asked me if I, uh, it was just before the summer holiday, they had a, a learning week. And that learning week was uh, people, like the, the kids, they could just pick subjects that were offered by external people. So not no teachers. So there was a hip hop wor uh, workshop. And they asked me if I could do two, two workshops throughout the whole week. So it was uh, uh, every day, like one and a half hours on each of those subjects with a group that I would be working with for four days. And one was uh, performance skills so more like pre yeah. presentation skills and the other one was life skills which was the far more fun one because uh, <laughs> always like life skills what the hell is that so I had to narrow it down but one of the things that we uh, covered during that week uh, in life skills was was um, uh, empathy and another topic that we uh, to uh, addressed that week in, in life skills workshop was uh, purpose li like life purpose like you know big big questions and what I still remember, uh, uh, there's many things I remember. I'll highlight two things that I'll remember. One, the, the kids, they're, so they're, they're age 12 to 15, right? Um, they found it so much easier to connect to purpose and, and having like a life, me, like, uh, like, um, uh, life purpose. They quickly connected it to, uh, to the, uh, you know, things like environment, things like just the local communities, uh, empathy, uh, uh, anti-discrimination work. No biggie. Um, so, so I think it's a, it shows that kids are incredibly receptive to it and they, they have far more capacity to understand these topics than we give them credit for. But the second thing that I remember from that week is on the first day in the life skills workshop, a girl came up to me at the end of the class and um, she asked me if, if I do work around addiction. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a specialist on addiction. I know a, just a little bit about addiction and it sometimes comes up in my work, but not in the classic way of addictions like, you know, like uh, alcohol addiction or drugs addiction. Well, we talk about addiction at work in terms of work can be an addiction mm. as well. So, so I... I understand some of the basics, uh, basic concepts there. And, and so I asked her, hey, uh, uh, what do you ask? Well, uh, what's your interest in addiction? And she told me that her father is, is an alcohol addict. And, and she, want, she, she wanted to know if I had some tips for her on how to deal with her father and how to help her father. We're talking about a 12-year-old. Talking about a 12-year-old girl who has the awareness and the the mental, emotional maturity to go up to a, a stranger who she just met two hours earlier. And, and, and her intent was to, to get more advice and tips and understanding on how to help her father. And she had never talked about this to any other teacher. Um, and so um, uh, that experience, I remember that because it highlights another, another couple of things. And that's one... Um, schools need to spend significantly more time on the emotional development and support for kids. And if we only focus on the subjects, but we don't focus on the kids that we're actually educating in schools and their stories and, and what's going on outside of schools, we're never going to be able to fully, like properly educate them. And um, it only takes empathy, care, att genuine attention that these kids will open up. 
And I would love to work more with kids. Um, and one of the things that I, um, that I do every year is um, I have a couple of principles that I try to implement in my life because because having you know having values is one thing but mm. that that just sounds good on paper so you have to operationalize values you have to turn them into sort of everyday principles so one of my principles is uh, spend one month of my time working for free uh, and that's my way of giving back so giving back is the value mm. uh, but but how do you operationalize that the rule is spend one month every year working for free and this project with that school uh, happened because of 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 me always looking for projects to, to, to kind of like volunteer my time and my skills. Um, I would absolutely love to work more with schools. So if any of the listeners today, <laughs> you know, has some opportunities, uh, reach out to me. Um, I think the problem is, um, I think the challenge is to find uh, projects that are more sustainable. Hmm. And I am more interested in projects that I believe have some sustainability in it. Do you feel like you have um, held on to some essential part of being a child, like in terms of relating? Do you remember what it was like to be there? Do you have a childlike portion of yourself that you still hold on to today and this this wonderful adulthood you're giving us? Um, so being adopted, um, one of the things that that, and I'll be eternally grateful for is that that our, our parents um, they didn't have to adopt. The they they adopted because they wanted to. So they they said, hey, there's a lot of kids in the world that that have no f no real future, no proper future for them, unless you know if if it's not for adoption. And so they decided, okay, let's let's give a few, rather than than adding more children to the world, let's give children who need it right now give them a future. Um, and um, I'll always be uh, grateful for that that they gave my sister my sister is a doctor uh, and, and so they gave us they gave us an opportunity for uh, having a future life that we own and I'll always remember that so yes for sure I want every um, not just every adult but I want every child to have a future and if it's not through adoption it can be through access to opportunities attention and care the kind of development that is far more important than learning <laughs> equations in, in school. So yeah, so so maybe that's the childlike part of me um, that I'll always tap into. Right. Um, and also, I will always think um, your life is sounds very busy because you're like your um, your work and your hobby, as you said, like it's all intertwined. So I'm just wondering. To bring it to the lighter note, <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for fun? Like, wh what's your what's uh, Kevin when he's <laughs> chilling and uh, color coding books? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I will say, spoken word for me is is a lot of fun. Yeah. So, I I I genuinely enjoy going to spoken word shows without performing, mm. um, and it's also a way to to meet to meet uh, fellow uh, artists and and that that is for me is an enormous source of energy and social connection uh, so I would say spoken word is definitely a major part in, yeah. in my life uh, a couple of other things that I really enjoy is is cooking and baking and and making coffee like art you know <laughs> quality artisanal coffees at home so I, I I have like a whole like I have six brewing methods at home I, I want to visit your beans. house man you look like the kind of friend I want to have <laughs> um, I, uh, surprisingly uh, this will surprise a lot of people probably but I am incredibly lazy <laughs> and, and so on the outside it looks that you know I'm, that I'm super busy but uh, when I'm at home I can easily just binge watch series and movies uh, and, and spend time watching documentaries listening to podcasts exploring spoken word mm. and and before I know it I've spent like eight hours online <laughs> um, so so that's the other side uh, side um, one of the other things that I uh, I enjoy a lot is uh, two more things that I really enjoy a lot I enjoy uh, creating shared experiences mm. so it can be anything right it can be taking friends on a trip or it can be organizing a, a dinner party or something uh, creating shared experiences. And the other thing is I enjoy traveling, but in, in a way, I love to just spend a lot of time in one place or one, one country mm -hmm. rather than kind of like just jumping. Yeah, rushing yeah. through and and then really slowing down and sometimes just observing life somewhere else. Mm. 
Wow, nice, beautiful. And um, another thing I'm wondering <laughs> is because uh, you're so uh, immersed into your work and I always feel also a little bit self-conscious with you. <laughs> is he analyzing me? Is my behavior? <laughs> Do you get that from like people like yes. friends? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I do people people wonder actually people do wonder whether I'm constantly analyzing and and and, and so the truth is it doesn't work that way. Um uh, maybe for some people, maybe for some professionals but, but not for me. So it is true that I can't disconnect my work from from who I am. Mm. Like that's part of who I am. And I'll always have this, probably have this fascination for human behavior. But um, when I meet people like in a bar or at spoken <laughs> word events or for, for dinner, I'm just me and I'm not actually paying attention in terms of analyzing. That part of like really very consciously analyzing people happens uh, when I'm in that work mode. So when I get, for example, uh, a group, a team, Mm. Uh, together in a room and I'm in the same room and then uh, I spend one or two two days with them and then that's where that mode goes on and I'm <laughs> and that's when I am looking at everything that people do and that what they also what they don't do yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so so on a, on a serious note right like so sometimes I've, I've had people that after they find out what I do they're like okay tell me who I am <laughs> Like it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, but if you would join a workshop in a setting that I have created mm. for, for a paid scenario, <laughs> you get compensated me, yeah. for what you do. Now, I will say, like, if if you come into a space that I own, that I create, where yeah. I set the rules, and you interact within that space, give me half a day, and I'll know stuff about you that your best friends don't know about you. Ooh, challenge accepted. <laughs> that sounds like a threat to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on you. I don't have friends. <laughs> so, I, you know, obviously you are um, at least trilingual, if not more linguals. Like what, how, where do you find the best way to express yourself is? Like which of those tongues, which of your oh. mooder tall, <laughs> which do you, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so um, in terms of poetry uh, and also emotionally, I feel most comfortable expressing myself in English. And and even though Dutch is my uh, Dutch is the language that I grew up with, depending on how you argue, South Korean would be my Korean would be my official like mother tongue. Or Dutch is my first language, but English is the language that I feel most comfortable expressing myself. And I don't really know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, uh, I guess also because uh, when I went to university, the study program was entirely in English. So basically, as of the age of 17, the default language in my life became English. Mm. And so now, I think in English. The, the funny thing is, when I do when I do work in Dutch, or if I sit into a, into a business meeting that's in Dutch, my notes tend to be in English. <laughs> which is super weird but it's because I, I find it easier to translate what I'm hearing in Dutch to English in my notes than to write it in Dutch. Um, I can't relate to that. I mean, I also speak a few languages and for me, English is something that I think about in, I think in, I dream in. Yeah. Sometimes I dream in Spanish, but I don't even speak Spanish. Yeah. So that's I mean, But else. is that some like Rosetta Stone thing? Like, because we all live in sort of the English speaking world. Is that just, be, that's become the, the, you know, the lingua franca of everything? For me, it definitely be, uh, is true that it became the default ever since I uh, studied, and yeah. ever since it became the default language. Because also my work is in English, and most of the the, the educational content that I that I uh, take in is tends to be in English. Yeah. So, uh, and English is still, yeah, I guess one of the most uh, dominant languages in the world as well. Yeah, and my friends, you know, every time I meet somebody here, and their English is not just um, functional, but it's idiomatically robust and I'm always surprised by that because of all the countries I've been to you don't get that kind of English in France I've seen you don't get that kind of English in Germany yeah. Portugal etc cetera, etc cetera. but but here it's you know people do that so excellently and it has to do with the fact that the culture everybody's eating has been American culture for so long or Ang Anglophone culture and that's kind True. of where people like grow up the movies True. the music the books that's where like as, it gets into you I remember as a kid I watched cartoons from Cartoon Network that were original versions, so mostly American, and they just had Dutch subtitles. Lucky I mean, you. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it is. It is really useful. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that, that's how indeed how even uh, as a kid, without being conscious about it, yeah. how much 
uh, English language and, and American pop culture or culture plays a role. I also, I think <laughs> languages are incredibly fascinating, not just from a perspective of learning language and being able to express yourself in different languages, but I also, I think we underestimate the significance of language in terms of uh, language shapes our reality. So, so um, we use language to uh, give meaning to what we experience. Mm. So we see something and we use language to describe what we're seeing. Uh, and people don't don't realize often the significance of that because of certain languages have certain words to describe some things that other languages don't have. Mm. And research has already shown that when people speak different languages, their voice changes sometimes. Different parts of the brain uh, are, are used. Uh, so it even affects the way we express ourselves and, and how we express ourselves. I think it's great that I remember in school we had access to four languages. I, well, so so Dutch was of course a language that you had to to learn, and English was another language that was obligatory. Then uh, electives were German and French, and then depending on on what level of school you did, you also had access to gr uh, Greek and Latin. Hmm. Nowadays, um, even schools already offer many more languages that you can uh, can learn. And so from a, a perspective of learning languages and being able to express yourself in different language, that's great. What I don't know for sure is if people, if schools and education pays enough also enough attention to not just learning the language grammatically, but the significance of language in the way that it shapes our reality. Mm. I'll tell you for damn sure they didn't do that when I was in school. <laughs> we just learned the freaking language and that was good enough. That seemed like a miracle in the American public school system anyway. <laughs> we even got that far with it. I'm wondering, do you have a favorite word in English? Or in any other languages that you speak? Uh, no, <laughs> no. No, nothing comes to mind right now, so. Hmm. Um, do you have your favorite word? I do. What is it? I don't know if you want me to say it on the air. <laughs> <laughs> Rhubarb? Rhubarb's a good one. <laughs> Rhubarb is. I, I hope it. I hope that's like a natively English word, but I do like rhubarb. Have you ever had rhubarb? Yes. It's weird, right? It's like celery, except it's like weird. It's in a pie. It's like a celery pie. I like it. <laughs> Not until I, I lived in North Carolina for a couple of years, and all of a sudden someone came with a rhubarb pie. I'm like, shit! I am in the South. Like this is what they do. You would never see a rhubarb anywhere north of Virginia. And I'm like, and I. Try, it's like, all right, got to try the celery pie. It's like, shit! This is good. <laughs> How is there a celery pie that's somehow good? This is not bullshit at all. So yeah, I have a very positive association with rhubarb, but it's an wow. it's, it's an adult association with rhubarb. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Yeah. I'm here to bring things to up. To bring rhubarb up? Yeah. <laughs> that's Exotic what I'm here. Vegetables. Any durian memory do you have? Dragon fruit? Jackfruit? Anything like that? I was born in Soviet Union. I met banana when I was 13. I guess the only vegetable <laughs> she had was steak. <laughs> Potato. Potato vegetable. All the way. Yeah. I think it's in my DNA. Every, everything, floating. right? All the, you're the George Washington Carver of potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with this beautiful uh, rhubarb note, I think it's time to thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, you, and uh, maybe just a quick uh, note about where do people, where can people find you online? Uh, or come to your home <laughs> <laughs> for, for coffee and, and cake. Uh, so that's uh, an invitation. You can't take that back. <laughs> I mean, I think I know where you live. Oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> How many people listen to? <laughs> uh, so, we'll put uh, that in the notes. <laughs> yeah. You've been geotagged. Um, if people want to follow, so on on Instagram they can find just like Instagram poetry, short snippets. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram, word.magician. Mm -hmm. If people want to follow the uh, and, and, and read more on the stories that I post and the uh, articles that I write and, and the longer performance pieces, and, uh, then they need to go to Facebook and that's where uh, Kevin Groen, G-R-O-E-N. Uh, and otherwise... He was looking at me when he said that, like I wouldn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, LinkedIn, the same thing, Kevin Groen. Great. So thank you so much, Kevin, for taking your time to be with us. Thank you very much. And we're still looking pleasure. forward to the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no pressure. Over. Just coming, coming directly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for listeners at home, you can find uh, the transcript of this podcast and all the notes on our website, www.wordapodcast.com. And of course, on social media. So don't hesitate to say hello. 
So we want to have a conversation about this episode. Get in touch with me and Evie on Twitter. It's probably the easiest way to do it. We're on Twitter at Word Up Podcast, at Word Up Podcast. I run the Twitter. You'll be talking to me. You have firsthand interaction with somebody, one of the voices on the show. I will probably get back to you, probably say something very nice, but we want to hear what you have to say about it because we're very excited about our guests and we're very excited about the show. So come and talk to us, everybody. Absolutely. And thank you so much again. And thank you, Bill, for being a great co-host. Thank you, Evie. And I appreciate your co-hostingness as well. Thank you. We are all very appreciated. Yes, we're appreciative people. <laughs> thank you so much. And doi! Doi! <laughs> By the way, okay. boobs, that's my favorite word, boobs, in English. <laughs> you can say that. Well, can no, say I that. could. I just want to make sure I wasn't, you know. Like specific boobs or just <laughs> boobs? All of them. I'm just a fan. Well, I like the word boobs because it makes you think of all the boobs. Yeah.